Well, last week we were in uh, chapter 3, uh, kind of going through that a little bit, uh, a little bit of review. Paul encourages us to be a praying church. Um, his encouragement in that is that knowing who Jesus is, knowing what he's done for us, uh, thinking about his grace, uh, that it would drive us to our knees in humility, that we would want to be on our knees in prayer simply because we are respectful, it's out of that awe, but it's humility that truly drives us there. And so we talked about three areas where uh, being humble uh, might drive you to your knees. And one of those ways was gratitude. Uh, Chapter one one and two speak of God's grace. And so it's out of that knowledge that we would want to be humble and kneel uh, before God. And then we talked a little bit about desperation, kind of Paul's passion and his desperation for these people and how he shed tears so many times uh, for the people, uh, that that drove him to his knees in humble desperation. Uh, And then we talked about humble confidence, that we have this boldness and confident access through faith in him, as we read in Ephesians 3, verse 12. Uh, This boldness, this confidence in who Jesus is drives us to our knees, and we're humble uh, because of that. So this morning, we're going to go to chapter 4, but before we do that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunities that you give to us to learn more, to read your word, and to grow in our faith. Father, I pray that as we continue our study of Ephesians, uh, you would be present with us here. You would send your spirit to this place that we might learn as much as possible this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things we're going to talk about today is unity in the body. We talked a little bit about unity a couple weeks ago, um, but this is specifically in the body of Christ. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, It was probably in the early 2000s that I personally started to become interested and it was a compelling movement, the emerging, emergent movement. Uh, this was, uh, it was interesting. And some of the things they were saying were actually quite uh, compelling. They, they made me want to know more. And so it was about 2007, Dan Kimball, he's a minister and author. Uh, he wrote a book um, for this movement before this, but in 2007 wrote a book called They Like Jesus, but not the church. And it's in this book that we learn that some of our younger generations are leaving the church because they're becoming more and more disheartened by what the body of Christ is, is, in, is doing and what they've been intended to be. I liked his book because I liked his desire to connect people um, on the outside of the church uh, with those on the inside. But we know that this this isn't really a new concept, that people like Jesus, but not the church. But from the beginning of the church, there have been critics. And so there's not really anything new that we learn uh, about these kinds of things. People are going to say what they're going to say. Then we have our own Brian Simmons, who wrote a book called Falling Away. uh, And then he followed it up with Wandering in the Wilderness. Um, These books address the falling away of the faith of some of his students, As he observed them as they got older, they left their faith completely behind and left the church. Um, And then recently, there's an author named James Emery White, and he wrote a book that's uh, addressing these same young people now classified as nuns. Not the black habit-wearing Catholic nuns, but that when they fill out a uh, census form where it asks you what religion you identify with, they check the box None. And so if you were to go on to Amazon, christianbook.com, you'll actually see that there are lots of books that address these different kinds of young people falling away, away from the faith or on why we're shrinking, on why generations are growing dissatisfied with the church. You'll find a lot of books. This is just a sampling of what I have and what I found online when I did my searching 
There's so many books about this. People are asking why. How can the church be losing people so rapidly? You know, there are church growth organizations doing what they can to address the loss of people in our churches and how our churches are shrinking at a more rapid pace. Now, let me set this aside for a second and think about uh, something completely different, but the same. You know, Gandhi is, right? Gandhi has been attributed as once saying, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. They are nothing like your Christ. I don't know if he really said that or not, but it's been attributed to him uh, quite often. But more and more of my Christian friends are adopting this quote as one of their favorites, that they are dissatisfied, so they're going to grab onto anyone who will speak their language. And Gandhi is someone to be admired in the way that he handled conflict in his own life. But at the same time, his view of Christ, that, that Christ acted differently in the Gospels than Christians did during Gandhi's life, is debatable, right? Perhaps he's correct. In some of his assessments about this, perhaps he's right. Um, he did witness some of these things. But I bring this up because while on the surface these might sound like realities, we must enforce and absorb into the teaching of the gospel. Um, I see some of this as misleading. Uh, I don't believe that the they that, that Kimball talks about in his book, the nuns, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, or Gandhi's Christ, his version of Christ, I don't believe they really like Jesus. I don't believe they like the true Jesus. I think that they, in these books, they like this diluted picture of Christ that has manifested itself in this world. It's a caricature, an exaggerated view of who Christ was and who he is. Unfortunately, this Jesus isn't the one that we read about in Scripture, right? If it's true that they like Jesus, they're an anomaly. Because during Jesus' day, the people didn't like Jesus. <laughs> and so if they really do like Jesus, they are different than the people in Scripture and the people who knew Jesus. The people Jesus came to give good news were quite angry with him because he expected something different from them. He upended the expectations of what God would have us to be as his followers. They hated Jesus so much that they killed him. And this way of Jesus that we're talking about is countercultural. And Paul knew this. When he's writing this, uh, this letter to the Ephesians, he knew this. When he gets to the fourth chapter, he directs the hearer to who they are in Christ and reminds them of how they're now supposed to act. If the they and the nuns of these books truly love Christ, they would love his church. These are the people who make up the body of Christ. That's what Paul is ultimately calling everyone to remember here. Yeah. But you're talking about people who claim that they like Jesus. A lot of the time nowadays, people like to pick and choose to coexist type stuff. You know? Sure. They'll take some of the stuff, oh, I like this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. All the other kind of religions and stuff out there. And they like karma. And stuff. <laughs> yeah, they'll mix and match whatever aspects of each religion they like. Uh, you know, I like that Jesus was peaceful and that he fed poor people. But they don't like the part when he says to not sin and, <laughs> and to not do these things and to follow him and obey his commands. And then you're right, they bring in things like karma. Oh, karma's going to get you for that. It's like, oh, do you even know what karma is? That's not how it works, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think, too, that, you know, when, it gets, when you look at Jesus, it's, it's, it's pretty clear cut. He's sinless. Mm -hmm. But when you get down to us, we're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Let's be honest about it. Yeah. The yeah. whole yeah. church is, is, is messy. Yep. It's, it's tough because yeah. of people. And, and so that's a very ungracious look yeah. at the church. Right. When you think about it, they're not, they're, not, they're not appreciating the grace that they've been given. That's right. And so they're not extending grace. Yeah. We weren't given structure exactly how it's supposed to be done, yeah. like yeah. in the Old Testament. So we don't know how to do 
do church yeah, yeah. the right way necessarily because we weren't really given instructions. So it's true. That's also part. That's why we have so many different ways of doing it out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like in Matthew 24, 12, it says, and because of iniquity abound the love of many wax cold, or because of the increase of evil, the love of many will grow cold. Uh, so along with not being taught, that's why Paul would teach us how you know, the body of Christ needs to act because, mm-hmm. because of evil in this world, the love of man grows cold even people in the church. We don't know how to love because there's so much evil out there. Yeah. Well, let's read. The, oh, yes, Helen. I'm thinking of a quote in Psalm 16. Mm-hmm. The saints who are in the likeness, they are the glorious ones in whom is almighty us. Mm-hmm. That's the church. Yes. And how God looks at us. Right. That's right. He loved us despite our faults. And we, we really need to be the same way. And that's what Paul's going to get at here in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, so let's read this together. Uh, we're going to read through verse 16 together. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, uh, uh, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature, stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul begins this section of of his letter here with an urgent plea to walk worthy of the calling with which they'd been called. He's in prison now. He's contending for the faith. He's continuing to preach Jesus as Lord, yet he calls everyone to walk worthy. Walking is frequently used in the New Testament. It's a designation of the Christian's total pattern of behavior. To walk worthy is to exhibit the kind of life that would do honor to the belief of faith in Christ one has put on. So Paul goes on then, he tells them what walking worthy looks like as a believer. In verses 2 and 3, he says it's with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. These qualities of Christian character are the opposite of the qualities glorified by the non-Christian. And in the pagan culture of Ephesus, these qualities were despised. They hated people who acted like this. This was the opposite of this culture. Uh, It has been said many times that um, our view of Christianity is this Greco-Roman narrative that we're actually uh, espousing that we got from uh, Augustine and that uh, the things that he believed. But the truth is is that the Greco-Roman culture hated this kind of life. They despised people who lived this way. 
they didn't view sin as a bad thing. They viewed it as a, a pride. They can be proud of the way that they live uh, against the way that Christ taught. And so to say that this is a Greco-Roman narrative flies in the face of everything that uh, Jesus taught and that Paul is preaching here in Ephesians. Um, Let's go through each one of these and talk about it a little bit. Uh, Humility, all humility. If you look at the word humility or in some of your translations, it says lowliness. I don't know how many of you have that. But humility is this virtue that Christians love. We love humility. And we talked a lot about being humble last week, our humility in Christ. It reflects an evaluation of ourselves. It's in respect of the infinitely righteous and holy God. Conceit coming from a Christian is a denial of the faith. If we're conceited, we're saying we don't believe in everything that Jesus taught. Humility is the fountain from which all Christian virtues come from. Our culture says, exalt yourself, pamper yourself, think about yourself first. Philippians 2.3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Um, let's go on to the next one. Gentleness. Yeah. I think humility is our toughest thing to do. Yeah. so culture Sure. <laughs> I'm so humble. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Humility is a, a, a big deal. And it's usually those that are not talking about it that we find to be the most humble. So, yeah. Well, let's look at gentleness. Gentleness or meekness. It's closely connected with this spirit of submissiveness. If you read about Moses in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it said, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. I don't know if this is one of those situations where Moses, who probably wrote this, <laughs> is calling himself, you know, it's like uh, the apostle that Jesus loved, <laughs> who wrote that. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, Moses, a meek man, he was not weak, though. So we can't describe meekness as weakness. It's not the same thing. It's not the same uh, um, aspect. He was actually quite bold if we look at Moses and the kinds of things that he did. Not, Not necessarily at first that he wanted to go and to do the things that God called him to, but he did it, and he did it boldly. Um... It doesn't mean that he's docile and easy to handle. It's actually a word of strength, uh, parautes, and it means mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, meekness. Um, It's strength under control. It's it's a powerful actual word. So when, when we're called to be meek, and when we hear that Jesus is meek, we can see that word as he's strong, but he's controlled. And it's that strength that allows you to control yourself in situations where you need that gentleness, where you need that meekness. Patience or long-suffering. This word is used of God's patience with men tons of times. And we won't read all of these, but... Or do, you supp- or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? I receive mercy for this reason, uh, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And as we see, it's over and over again, this patience of God. Barclay, in his commentary, said of God, if God had been a man... He would long since have wiped out the world for all its disobedience. Paul's use of this word here suggests that Christians should be tolerant, forgiving, and understanding of one another's mistakes and sins. Not that we, you know, not that we revel in those sins, not that we say, oh, you're fine, but that we, we understand and we help someone through those things. We have patience with them. Yes? Well, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. What does it mean that he who ascended 
Yeah. To me, I believe that for it says he descended, but it also says that, you know, to those who were disobedient uh, long ago, yeah. not only reached in the name of Noah and Mark and made bills. He gives you some people say that Mark could have taken 120 years to build because uh, of that reference, but just that God wasn't, like, it's not like God was being patient waiting for Noah to finish the finish of the ark, just being patient with the people. That we're sitting right. Yeah. It's kind of quite Definitely. All right. Let's look at the next one. Bearing with one another in love. This is a tough one, right? This simply means that a Christian should accept his place with other Christians, having an attitude that grants them the same right to belong, which he claims for himself. Peter says, "Love covers a multitude of sins." I don't know if I put that up there. No. Um, love covers a multitude of sins. That's 1 Peter 4, 8. This is the only way that a marriage works, right? <laughs> if I had to put up with me, one of us would have to die. <laughs> but my wife puts up with me, and this is the way relationships in the body of Christ work as well. You know, we, we put up with one another. We put up with a lot, and that's what we're called to do, actually to put up with quite a bit. Now, there are there are ways that we go through the process of uh, discipline and, and finding ways to get people on the right path. But at the same time, we are to bear with one another quite a bit. And then finally, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So Jesus prays for unity among the believers in Christ. Here it appears that unity is brought up again by Paul. Why is there so much disunity in the world? You know, there's no magic devices capable of bringing unity out of chaos. And it appears by this verse here that unity is not produced by Christians, but it's produced by the Holy Spirit. We're admonished to keep it. Unity is active. Uh, We should be zealous to maintain unity. So Paul begins this section with this powerful call of all these different uh, virtues for the Christian to walk worthy of this calling. What does he mean by this? What is he talking about? Why are these virtues the foundation for walking worthy? Sure, yeah, why, what does he mean by to walk worthy in light of all these virtues here? These are the things that he's calling them to. Why are these the foundations for unity, for walking worthy? You know, why, why patience, gentleness, humility, bearing with one another in love? It would be very difficult to have unity without all of those things or any one of those things. Okay. Um, I mean, it seems like we'd be, we'd be giving in to our, our selfishness and giving in to our... Our, our feelings, our anger, our mm-hmm. frustration all the time. You kind of need these things to have unity, right? These are the, the, the attitudes and the virtues that someone needs in order to, to unite with someone who disagrees with them or who's not acting right. Yeah. It, it, it also, the, the virtue prevents us from having uniformity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody says, don't do it. Exactly my way. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. Yeah, yeah. And so virtue is kind of folded in check. Nobody gets their own way. Yeah. That uniformity aspect was something that I was reading in one of the commentaries as I was doing my studying that we have unity, but not uniformity. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, It doesn't mean that we all do the same things, and we all live exactly the same way. Um, But we have unity in spite of that, right? And maybe because of that. And because of that, yeah. (laughs) There's a graciousness in our attitude. Yeah, yeah. So if if we go back to verse 1. Sure. We're called to walk in a manner worthy. Yes. Okay. And then 
I would suggest he describes some of that, the humility, the love. Yeah. Okay. And in the unity, but that the basis of the unity is now coming. Mm -hmm. The one, the one, the one, mm -hmm. the one, the one. That oneness yeah. is what unifies us. Okay. Yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about those ones in just a second, but yeah, you're right. Yes. So it's talking about bearing with one another. We probably wouldn't be friends with most of the people <laughs> that were brothers and sisters yeah. with if we didn't know them as brothers and sisters. That's right. We don't get a picture siblings. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. But, <laughs> How could we have a church if we all disagreed and didn't have these things as the foundation for how we treat one another? I don't think it would be possible. And I think that that's why some of the they don't understand unity. The nuns that we're talking about, the they, they don't understand unity and what that looks like. That we can disagree about some things. Again, like Craig said, we're going to talk about the ones now in just a second, but those ones are the things that matter. And we're, and we're going to read through that here uh, in just a second. Um, so Paul goes on to cite what would be called kind of an early Christian creed. He goes through these ones uh, with, these, with these Ephesians, these seven statements to emphasize the oneness that we share in the gospel. So let's read through this part here. There is one body... And one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father in all, who's over all and in all and through all and in all. I, I said that wrong. <laughs> but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we have one body. We share a common existence in Christ's church. We're, we're diverse, right? We're diverse in our background. Uh, how we were raised, the places we lived in, um, what kinds of parents we had, or maybe parents we didn't have, um, the environment that we were in, the, whether it was hostile towards us for whatever reason. Um, I grew up in a really terrible hometown. Um, people would fight with one another all the time. Uh, I got attacked on the way to the bus stop by kids. And uh, I had a kid that would pick on me on the bus and he was protected by all the gang members on the bus so I couldn't say anything or I'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's tough. But because of my parents and the way they raised me, I learned to love people even when it was difficult. And so uh, we all encounter things in our lives like that. Uh, and that's, that's where we come from. We all have different backgrounds. We're diverse. We have different gifts. We've all been given different gifts in the body. Um, you know, in verse 11 and following, I don't know if I put it up here. Yeah, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Um, we're given different gifts, and we need these different gifts in order uh, to build up the body. Uh, and if you haven't yet, if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, on the back of the bulletin, there's actually a link where you can take a little quiz and learn what your spiritual gifts are. It's actually not on the back. It's on the last page before you fold it over. There's a little link here. You can take a spiritual gifts survey and learn what your gifts are and then how you can use those in the body. Yeah, sure. I think if you look at the structure of this, yeah. the, the call to unity yes. is rooted in the seven ones. I don't know about your experience. My experience is that the division within Christianity is, is really over those things. Yeah. And almost without fail, every time I run into people who are obviously off on one, they're off on more than one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, you don't get six, typically you don't get six on target. Like yeah, that. yeah. But but there's a con, seven starts with the word but. Because because those are ones, but the gifts aren't. Yeah. They're different. Yeah. 
and say not all are apostles, not all are prophets. Oh, right. Correct. So, yeah. so our, our unity isn't because we are gifted the same and we all look alike right. and all of that. The unity is on the oneness of Christ and we are diverse within that unity and gifted differently within right. that body. And Correct. Christ. Yeah. And that, that's why I highlighted this second part with verse 16 is that, you know, even if you're not one of these things up here, there's also this, the whole body joined together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow. So, yeah, I agree. Yes? Well, I mean, even if you fell out of the way, you may not really have to be doing the gift because in verse 12 it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ. So if your gift is not... That's what your gift is for, is for the work of the Spirit to edify the body. So mm -hmm. if your gift is not doing that, then maybe it's not your gift. Okay, yeah, maybe. Perhaps. Yes, Helen? Well, I was thinking the man wrote a book about the nun. Mm -hmm. We are the one. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. We are the ones. They're, they're the nuns. They're the nuns. We're the ones. <laughs> That's right. We gotta teach the nuns how to be one, right? <laughs> All right, next one is one spirit. And I'll go through these pretty quickly. We've only got a few minutes left, and then I got some more questions. Uh, we share this common origin. It's in the Holy Spirit's work. Uh, the Spirit's the one who creates unity, and He empowers us to maintain it. And then we have one hope. We share this common hope in Christ. That's what the Gentiles were missing. Remember we talked about what they were missing before? They didn't have hope in Christ. So then they focused on other gods, idols, on themselves. And they didn't know that hope. They thought this was it. This world is it. And so I've got to focus on that now. But now we have hope. And we must live in a manner worthy of our calling. We have one Lord. Believers confess and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. When the early Christians said, Jesus Christ is Lord, they were saying, Caesar's not Lord. And that would cause them probable death. Uh, they would not live. Uh, this was boldly identifying Jesus with the God of Hebrew Scriptures. So this is not just some affirmation that an early believer was saying. You know, we say Jesus is Lord and nothing happens to us. <laughs> we can be confident in that. For them, it was a confession to lose their heads. And in many cultures today, to say Jesus is Lord is to say, I'm going to lose my entire family. Uh, the kinds of religions that they believe in would say that now I'm the outcast and they can't have anything to do with me. Um, they would disown them and you could become an outlaw. And so it, it has uh, implications for today as well to say that Jesus is Lord. But one Lord is one of the things that we confess. One faith this reminds us that we're embracing the essential truths together. Faith here seems to refer to the body of truth that we believe. And then we have one baptism. We share a common salvation. This is the initiatory rite of admittance into the Christian religion. If one baptism is the same one Christ commanded his followers to administer to all nations. Uh, in Matthew tw chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. I don't think I put that up here. No. Uh, one God and Father. As his adopted children, we share the same Father. He's the God over all and the Father of all his children, regardless of their history, their ethnicity, and background. We're one big adopted family. All right. I blew through those really fast. Uh, so let me just say this, or ask this. Why is unity so important in the church? Why does a church modeling, or what does a church modeling unity look like? Jesus calls us to unity, that we, based on our unity, that would be a reflection upon Christ and God and the Spirit as they are. Yeah. Yeah. I think when the church is not unified, it makes us weaker and more open to culture tearing us down and. Yeah. Um, just, just wearing the church down. Yeah. When we're not unified. For sure. I, I walked into a church years ago in, in Indiana, 
And immediately you knew there was a flaw. Hmm. And it was it was so evident. In fact, I've, I've done this a couple of times where I walked into a building and it's obvious that they had splits. Hmm. And I mean, this one time it was a small town. There was a mental health hospital there. A friend of ours was the head of it, uh, part of it, and. Um, uh, it was a reflection uh, on. It was a poor reflection of a poor reflection for Christ that the, that the church had split, and so I mean that's yeah. we can't be unified with each other. What's what's our testimony? Right. It shows. I've gone to several French churches just on my own when I was in the military. I saw one in Thailand, one in North Carolina. I saw, and when I walked into those, I was welcome. I was part of that family. Mm. And I think that's what unity and body kind of looks like. It's, it's the fact that you were welcome wherever you go. Yeah. You have family and those will look out for you wherever you go. Um, a lot of the military, especially the Marine Corps, were that way. Mm. As soon as we know that there's another Marine, we're instantly connected. Mm-hmm. We instantly have that unification of we both went through the same thing. We know yeah. what that's like. So no matter how different we are outside, what our jobs are now, we still have that thing that unifies us. Yeah. S- sadly, in in many places, we think about uh, gangs and how those are formed. And uh, my youth minister growing up was a police officer, and he worked with gang units and SWAT team and, and other areas. And a lot of these young men enter into gangs because they don't have a good family at home. They have this difficult home life where they don't feel wanted. They don't feel like there's a place for them. But a gang, they claim they care about them and they look out for them. They got their back no matter what happens. Um, the reality is, is that if something goes wrong, they'll abandon them. But it's you know, once you're out of prison and they act like you're welcome back, everything's fine. And you wonder, you know, why would you leave a, a good place if, if they've got a good home life? Uh, or maybe you think about the church. Uh, I think it was in Crazy Love where Francis Chan talks about uh, a young man or I don't know, he's an older man now, but he was a, in a gang and then he got to the church, became a Christian got to the church and, and wondered why it was not like all the things that he had learned about the church. This is supposed to be like a family. Why aren't we acting like this? He, he sadly said that the gangs were more of a family than what the church had looked like. Again, he might be classified as one of these nuns, one of these people that we talk about in the book. Um, yeah. Sometimes when, when we look at, well, maybe all the time, when we look at education, we're, we're looking at it from our... American perspective, mm-hmm. in Christian country, churches everywhere, yep. and while the churches of Christ aren't the largest, there's still quite a few of us around. Sure, yeah. Uh, in their setting, the church was a dribble. Yeah. It was small yep. uh, relative to all the other religious, you know, Diana worship and all mm-hmm. the stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. And I think Paul's giving them this insight into the significance of the church, that they're, they are in heavenly places, everybody's in heavenly places, but they're in heavenly places in Christ, they are blessed there. Uh, and, and the church is significant, what Christ has done is significant, and this unity is part of, to be a part of that body and a part of that family mm-hmm. is a big deal yeah. for these early Christians. Yeah, it really was. And he's trying to remind them to in some ways, overlook the things that seem to tear you apart. You've got a special family here who does care about you. Yeah, it's important. When there's strength in numbers and when when you don't feel like you have, you know, a family behind you or or that there's, there's things that you can unify as a church on, it's hard to stand up against those teachings that it's telling us about to be, you know, not be strayed by false teaching and, yeah. and things like that when it comes up. It's hard to stand strong and be 
stand against those things when we're not unified. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. I say because uh, disunion is, is not love. I mean, God is love, and as you work into become unified, you're not think of yourself greater than others. You're those who seem less honorable, you're treated with more honor. Mm-hmm. You're looking after widows and orphans. When you're doing all this stuff, you bring yourself to that level also. And you're, as you love other people, you yourself are, are allowed to be loved. And you know, once you're, once everyone's showing love, then that's, that's, I mean, God is love. So you end up loving God in return. Yeah. Do these exhortations by Paul, does this discourage you or does it encourage you? And what about it encourages you or discourages you? We're all responsible for the church's unity. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say it encourages uh, because, yeah, the Bible is saying that you can't be unity, you know. Yeah, I'd I'd say that even most of us that even have a lot of friends, I think, in many ways, they'd want to be unified with other people. Too. Mm-hmm. And I think deep down, we all want to be unified with each other. Yeah. I think it's something that we're never going to feel like we, we have perfect unity, mm-hmm. and, but it's something we should always be striving towards and, and working towards, and it's not going to be easy. Mm-hmm. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, right? We're supposed to pray for our neighbors. I was at Men's Day yesterday over at Columbia Christian. Dave Aston spoke, and it was really quite good. And he, he talked about that aspect of praying for your enemies. Praying for your neighbors, pray for your enemies. And he said, how hard is that to pray for someone who's an enemy? He said, but once you start doing it, and you're praying for your enemies every day, they start to look a little more human and a little more... Uh, you're a little more empathetic towards them to where you're not feeling so uh, angry at the things that they do and and the way that they might treat you. Um, And he's like, you might find that you actually make a friend and that it breaks down walls, breaks down barriers between the two of you to where someone who was your enemy now becomes your friend. And then there's an open open, uh, opportunity to share the gospel with them. So it's important, right? So how much more so can we have unity with fellow believers, people who we believe at the heart and core of our message, we believe the same things. We can have unity. Yeah. God tells us that he has made us one. Okay. Yeah, that's right. We have, yes. We just have to, we're called to live it out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that's it. Let's pray and uh, we'll be done this morning. Father, we again come before you. We're humbled and we're thankful for this opportunity to read from your word. Father, I do pray for unity. There are so many churches that argue with one another, uh, churches that are not even the same location who will argue with another church in a different location. Father, I pray that we would be one, that we would find our, our unity in your son Jesus and, and build bridges and relationships with other Christians around the world. Father, we are a witness to the world, and there are people that don't know you. And we want to share this gospel message with other people and win them for your son, Jesus. And it's hard to do sometimes with the way that we treat one another. And so I pray that we would have more unity. You would give us the strength that we need each and every day to bear with one another's burdens and to live, live out the message uh, that your son, Jesus, preached while he was here on earth. Father, I pray for our worship assembly, our second assembly, that you would be with us this morning as we worship together. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.